Section 66 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Flirting and What Came of It at an open window wide just across the way sits a roguish little blonde nearly all the day playing with a tabby cat and gazing down below flirting with conductors that are passing to and fro some receive a passing nod and some receive a smile but she watches number six whilst going half a mile and the gay conductor while he's throwing kisses there doesn't hear the signals given by an aged pair though the man as best he can whistles loud and shrill and the wife as though for life charges down the hill and the blameful driver while he gazes wistful back doesn't see the little child a creeping on the track soon the jury summoned there to question how it died will as their opinion give a case of suicide and the driver and his mate acquitted from all blame kisses at the blonde will throw and she'll return the same end of section sixty six recording by alan mapstone Section 67 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bill Mosley, Lano County, Texas, USA. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. The Champion Mean Man Yesterday I came across a singular-looking individual dressed in a greasy, dingy suit. He was sitting on a log before his door, engaged in repairing a shovel handle. Say, stranger, I said, addressing him, can you inform me where Deacon Shellbark lives? The farmer looked up, pushed his slouched hat back on his head and after surveying me some time in silence drawled out be you any relation of hisn no i replied a little surprised at his manner of answering i haven't a relative in the state by thunder i congratulate you upon your good fortune he ejaculated particularly because there's no tie of consanguinity existing atwixt you and old deacon shellbark he's expectin a son home and i thought you might be him well he continued pointing with a huge jackknife that he held in his hand you see that house to the left of them scrub oaks don't you that our building with the leetle cupola on it well, thar's where old Deacon Shellbark lives, the meanest man in this year county. And that's sayin' considerable, too, cause we got some vicey fisted customers round these year parts, men who scrape the puddin' pot mighty clean before the dog gets chance to canvas it. Now I can tell you, but i feel safe in stickin in old shellbark at the head and i ain't a gwine to haul him down another i don't believe in talkin much about one's neighbors but i generally tell strangers what sort of a man he is cause if they go to tradin with him and art on their guard he'll skin him quicker than a whirlpool sucks in a dead fish you know the deacon then i remarked while the hope i had entertained of getting his name on my subscription list began to take to itself wings 
Yes, I reckon I do know him, he replied. Pooty well, too. A great sight better than is profitable to him, and he knows it. Oh, you bet he knows it, and he hates me as he does the dry murrain that gin the crows fifteen of his best cows last summer. I knowed him back in Scrabbletown. They wouldn't allow him to come within a pistol shot of a church back thar, because they'd more than suspect he stole the wine and bread from the communion table one day. They were down on him, flattering a stone on a cricket allers afterwards. He's a deacon out here, though, but that ain't nothing. He can't fool me with his praying. I want no such crooked old disciple as he is interceding for me, you know. I was hoping he would subscribe for this book, I remarked. But I'm afraid there's not much use of my going there if he is so very mean. Look here, stranger, he remarked earnestly. You might just as well stop thar while you're standing. Subscribe. He'll gig back from a subscription list just as he would from a six-shooter. Oh, but this is a religious work, and perhaps he would lend that his support, I answered quickly. Religious work be shelved, exclaimed the farmer. That doesn't help you any. You can't do anything with him, cause he hain't got no more soul than an empty gin bottle. You might as well bait a rat trap with a cat's head and expect the varmin to go nibbling at it. As to expect him to put his name down to anything that's a gwine to take coin from his pockets. You're a stranger in these year parts, I see. Therefore, you haven't the slightest idea what a towering mean man he is. Why, he'd run a mile to get on the sunny side of a feller to cheat him out of his shadow. I knowed him back in old Indiana. He's from the same place that I am, but you can kick me clear over to them foothills and back again if I don't feel like taking pison every time I have to own up to it. He used to be in cahoot with a tanner back thar named Doby. Sleepy Doby, the boys called him, for he was the sleepiest feller you ever did see. Go asleep while working at anything. He would drop asleep sometimes while scraping a hide and cut the consarn thing all into parents. At other times, he would fall back into the tan vat, then wake up and holler for the boys to come and fish him out. They say he dropped asleep once while wringing a hog to prevent him from rooting up the clover patch. The minister of the village had to pause in the middle of a sermon he was preaching half a block away until the squealing subsided. But as I was gwine to tell you, before the rheumatism got into his giants and made him shun water as he would a tax collector, old Shellbark used to be pooty fond of fishing. One day Parson Bodfish was gwine off to have a day's sport and took me along to carry the fish. I was only a boy then and mighty tickled because I could go. Just about the time we got to the river, we overtook old Shellbark a pointin' thar too. When we got to the bank, they both set in getting out thar hooks and lines, and then for the first time, old Shellbark found out he had left his bake to hum. So he commenced to sputter and fret, taking on terribly about it until Parson Bodfish says to him, That's all right, I reckon I've got enough bait in this box for both of us and I'll give you half a bun, and let us start in and make the most of it. So the parson, who had a heart the size of a sheep's head, took out his bait box and gin him more than half. It so, I seed him when he took him out. Pooty soon arter, while the parson was a-standin' on a log that horned out over the water, a baitin' of his hooks, a big-mouthed fish-hawk gin a chattering screech overhead and startled him a little, and while looking up he let his bait-box fall into the river. The box was open, so the worms were scattered ever which way, and away went box and bait a flukin' down the rapids, and the parson's cusses follered out her. 
He did swar by a hunky. I heard him. He had a mighty hot temper, and it was more than he could do sometimes to keep it down. A feller couldn't blame him much for swarring just then, cause twas a pooty trying time. He turned round sort of quick when he thought of me being thar. I seed him turning though, and let on to be talking to a fish that I was stringing on, so he reckoned I hadn't noticed him. We hurried on down the river, and arter a while overtook old Shellbark, who was snaking him out as fast as he could fix bait and throw in. I lost all my worms back thar while standing on a log, says the parson, and we'll have to fall back on you for some. The old snipe grumbled out something about being out of all patience with people who are so fool careless. Arter a while he took out the rag he kept the worms in, and although he had quite a large knot of em, he gin the parson just one, and dead at that. It's so. You may laugh, but I seed it. When he was a-pickin' it out and handin' it to him, and when Parson Bodfish was a-stickin' the hook into him, he lay thar and took it as easy and never squirmed or objected the least. You'd have thought it was a link of vermicelli the Parson had picked out of a soup plate. When Parson Bodfish took it from him, he held it between his finger and thumb a while, just that way, and I swore I felt solid sure he was gwine to slap it back into old Shellbark's face. He didn't, though, but he did look as if he'd liked to mighty well. He stood thar and stared him in the face, as if actawally in doubt about his being the person he divided with in the morning. Arter a while, he baited his hook and started in right thar. He had amazing good luck, too, with one bait. He hauled out four flopping great chubs, one right arter the other, and during the same time, old Shellbark didn't get a bite from anything but mosquitoes. He seemed just tearing mad over it, too, I can tell you. He stood there a flopping and a scratching and a slinging of his line out the full length, trying on all sides continually, but to no purpose. At last, thinking he had a fish when he didn't, he switched up his line so spiteful it caught in a treetop more than fifteen feet above his head, and while he was a-gawping up there, jerking the line and stamping around, he sawed his foot flat on his string of fish that were lying there on the bank, and squashed the innards out of nigh every one of em. Between thar slipperiness and his confusion, hurrying to get off him before they were spiled, he fell and slipped away down the bank head first, a clawing and a kicking just like a skeered alligator. Only he chanced to strike against an old root that was sticking up at the margin of the river. He'd have gone plumb to the bottom for sartin. Unfortunately, the last fish Parson Bodfish caught had swallowed the bait. So he says to me kind of low, Dolphus, let's see if we can't skeer up a lizard or something that'll do for bait when a man's in a pinch. So we set in to hunting and sarching under old logs and stones and dead wild grass, but couldn't get hold of anything. The parson fell three times on all fours in the dirt, and gin his wrist a mighty bad sprain while pursuing a queer long-legged horned critter, something like a cricket, only poisonous, I guess. I could have caught it once, as it went droning past, but didn't feel like touching it. Finally it got stuck into a clump of ferns, and he gin it up. So, order a while, he says, I'll have to go back and try that old shell bark again, though I'd rather take a dose of Ipecac than do it. So we come back to where he was fishing. He looked mighty solemn and was muddy as an old stone boat. Says the parson to him, I'll have to call on you again for another dead worm. The one you gimme is all gobbled up. 
"'Seems to me you're mighty extravagant with the bait,' he says gruffly, and switching his line round and slinging it out as far as the pole would let it go, but not making the least motion to comply with the parson's request. "'Wall, I don't know how that is,' says Parson Bodfish, kind of easy-like and trying to keep down his anger that I seed was rising just like bilin' sugar. I nabbed four rousing good fish with that one bait. I reckon that's doing pretty well. Fact, I know it is. They seem to bite first rate at dead worms just now. Well, I don't know anything about that, says the old narrow gauge. Supposing you cut up some of your fish and see if you can't catch something with that sort of bait. Fish bite pooty well at that sort of offering just before rain, they say. And you ain't a gwine to give me any worms, says the parson, in a husky voice and shaking like a rag in the wind. He was so chock full of passion. Well, this is a sort of curious world, Mr. Bodfish, says old Shellbark, slow and niggardly like. Just that way... And without a feller looks out for himself, he ain't considered nothing. Sides, you know, he continued, fish bait is a good deal like an oyster or a bean, something that's mighty hard to divide with a feller. And he commits to troll along downstream. Apple sass and spinach. I never did see a man so riled as that parson bodfish was since I could distinguish the moon from a lightning bug. He changed to all the colors of the rainbow by turns in less time than I'm telling you. You never see such a struggle between sin and piety as raged inside that parson for about five minutes. First piety seemed to be getting on top. Then sin would choke her down and hold her thar. At last he turned round and run full chisel behind the turned-up roots of a big windfall, as though a gallon and a half of black hornets were arter him. I reckoned he was gwine arter stuns to gin the old feller a good pelton, and that kind of work being right into my hand, I ran thar too, calculating to help him do it, but I was mistaken. He wasn't gwine arter stuns. For I seed so soon as he thought he was out of sight, he flopped down on his knees right thar in the mud, a holdin' his hands jined together above his head just that way. I allowed he was a-gwine to pray then for sartin, but he didn't pray, no siree, not much prior. Just then, he swore though, he did. I heard him just as plain as could be, says he. I swore I'll get even yet with that old shellbark if I have to yank him out of his grave like a body snatcher to accomplish it. I felt like running thar and saying, Don't rise yet, let me kneel and swar too, the same as that tricky feller does in the play while he's a foolin' the jealous nigger so bad. But I knowed it wouldn't do, cause he didn't want me to see him kneel thar in the mud. So, when he came back, he found me pelting a frog as if nothing had happened. Come, Dolphus, says he. It's getting pooty late. I guess we might as well be a moving back home. So we turned back toward the village, though twant more than noon, and left old Shellbark fishing thar. He did get even with him, though. One Sunday soon arter Parson Bodfish was... Here the farmer was interrupted by a wild-looking female who stuck her frowsy head out of an open window like a turtle out of its shell and shouted in anything but a sweet voice, Dolphus, you natural-born talking machine, you, what are you a settin' a pratin' and a pratin' about out thar? That old hog is in the garden again, a hoistin' the parsnips and crunchin' him like an old bar. Consarn her spotted hide, he vociferated jumping up and grabbing a huge cudgel that lay nearby. Just you stop here, stranger, for about ten seconds till I make that old swine think thar's a trip hammer got a foul of her. Then I'll tell you how the parson got even. I couldn't stop to hear the story anyway, I replied, for I must be traveling. 
However, I'll take your advice and give the deacon a wide berth. As I descended the hill, the swine's wail was ringing in my ears, and I judged the trip hammer was at work. End of section 67《Section 68 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. In a Thousand Years, A Woman's Dream of the Future. "'Twill be all the same in a thousand years. "'What a terrible line this is, to draw out the tears. "'Oh, how oft do I weep at the dance or the play, "'or the sorrows we women are doomed to convey. "'And can it be so, must we stand at the gate, "'denied all the honors of the country or state? "'Our part but to please and obey lordly man, "'be kind when he's surly, and be sweet as we can.' as students to shiver like leaves in the breeze if we chance to infringe on his rules or decrees then have pity ye gods who look down on our case shut from bar bench and school board and every fat place to pick up the pennies that oppressors fling down for cutting and stitching and clothing the town oh the tyrant's sharp lash his pooh-poohs and his sneers will be all the same in a thousand years. Ah, tis not the same in a thousand years. How sweet and how pleasant our life now appears, for women no longer bow down at the nod of creatures who ruled with a chain and a rod. But as lawyers they plead, and as doctors dissect, and in temples of learning control and direct, the weak-footed student at mile-posts may rest without springing a mine in the president's breast. There's no splitting of hairs to deny her the prize. She receives her diploma and a blessing likewise. Now women no more stitch and stew for their lives, or suffer injustice because daughters are wives. Though they sit down as jurors, they judge and they vote, and steering through life ply an oar in the boat. The mother departed looks down here with pride, on her merciful child dealing charity wide, while man that once governed so harsh and severe applies for positions in meekness and fear. Now the cane of the dude is no more on the street, the eyeglass is missing, and sharp pointed feet. The poor chappy himself is beyond the bright spheres, for tis not the same in a thousand years. End of section sixty eight. Read by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section sixty nine of Frontier Humor and Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. The Cobbler's End. A large crowd of people was standing in and around a small shoemaker's shop on Third Street. Elbowing my way to the inner circle, I found the excitement was over a man who had committed suicide. He was lying upon the floor, his hands still grasping a shotgun with which he had blown off the top of his head. I learned it was the shoemaker, and that he had committed the rash act because the lady on whom his affections were set had been seen fit to choose another for her partner. Worst of all, it was a tailor who, to use a common expression and one to the point, had cut him out. They were both charmed with the comeliness of the young woman and whenever an opportunity offered, were in the habit of throwing sheep size in the direction of her apartment. The lady seemed to grow more interested in the situation, and even went so far as to smile archly upon him. 
The tailor, who had never received such a compliment from so pretty a woman before, was quite carried away with joy. He felt that his love was returned, and from that moment, the world presented a different aspect. It was not even a new picture in an old frame, or vice versa, but was new throughout. Even the old breeches on his lap seemed to suddenly undergo a strange metamorphosis, the stout, rough material over which he had lately been bending with crippled fingers and sprung needle, in the twinkling of an eye seemed transformed into a golden fleece, through which the wax thread flew like chain lightning through a cotton umbrella. To have an interview was now his only study, and where there's a will, there's a way. One day a small boy was pressed into service and entrusted with a letter to the woman in whom his whole heart seemed wrapped. She received it safely and duly by the return of post broke the delightful intelligence to the tailor that his love was returned and ended the epistle by requesting him to call. Hardly had Seely night scarfed up the tender eye of pitiful day when the tailor with palpitating heart ascended the rickety stairs that led to the apartment. How he was received there is no knowing, but it is apparent to all he soon ingratiated himself with the handsome damsel, as the sequel shows. The knight of the thimble and needle had saved considerable money and was comely to look upon. While she was both free and willing to wed, so the courtship was a short one. As it happened, the tailor had received an offer from a business firm in the country that day, and as delays were considered dangerous, they decided to be married at once and start for their new home. It chanced that neither the lover nor his fair enamorata were troubled with enough luggage to require the services of an express wagon, and it wasn't long before their traps were stuffed into sacks and bundles ready for removal. Talk about striking while the iron is hot. They went ahead of the time-honored injunction and hammered the iron while it was yet in the furnace. The bat had hardly found his evening meal before they were united and received the congratulations of the officiating clergyman, and before Hesperus led her starry host down to the western main, the happy pair might have been seen bending under their respective burdens and moving rapidly down the thoroughfare to catch the first train for the country. Crispin soon discovered his handsome bird had flown. This was too much for the poor cobbler. He couldn't bear up under the weight, and having procured a shotgun, soon ceased to exist. These facts I gleaned from a grocer who lived nearby and who was acquainted with all the parties. My mind was so disturbed by the distressing event, I found it impossible to sleep for hours after I reached my room. I started in to recite a book of Paradise Lost, but it was no go. I had Michael assaulting Satan with a shoemaker's awl instead of with his sword of celestial temper. I then endeavored to run over and act in Shakespeare, but met with no better success. I had Othello blowing his head off with a shotgun instead of stabbing himself with a knife. Still, the terrible combination of circumstances culminating in the death of the poor cobbler crowded upon me in a saddening train and much-needed rest came not to my relief until the following lines were composed and set to music. Oh, the sunshine of his life had become a tailor's wife, which was more than selfish heart could bear. So he got his gun in haste, in his mouth the muzzle placed, turned his eyes aloft as in prayer. On the trigger set his toes, as the illustration shows, then up to the ceiling went his hair. End of section 69, read by Julie Taylor, January 16th, 2022. Section 70 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. The Last of His Race. While passing through the market this morning, I saw the old turkey that had escaped the ravages of Christmas. He is said to be the sole remnant of the turkey tribe, living or dead at present to be found. 
though the door of his coop was opened, he seemed to have no desire to escape. Evidently, like Byron's prisoner of Chilean, he has been so long an inmate, he has become attached to it and would rather remain there than take his chances in the busy world outside. He stood most of the time in the center of the coop in a brown study. Once, while I was looking at him, he attempted to expand the dilapidated substitute for a tail and assume the dignity and strut of other days. The effort was too much for him, and he settled down again into a dreamy, somnolent state from which the crowing of a large Brahma even failed to arouse him. The poor fellow will doubtless fall a victim to man's rapacity on New Year, for I noticed a fleshy old epicure regarding him with hungry, sinister looks. Nay, more, setting a price upon his head. Passing again through the market this afternoon, I noticed the coop was empty. The prisoner of Chilean was missing. Who had purchased him? Or what had become of him? Were questions which, however pertinent they might be, I felt I had no right to ask, and I didn't. But the finger of suspicion points directly at the mouth of that venerable justice who was setting a price upon his head. End of section 70, read by Julie Taylor, January 16, 2022. Section 71 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Jim Dudley's Race. Now that I am rid of my wildcat mining stock, my aching teeth, and inverted toenails. Jim Dudley turns up again with his stories and slang. Last night he told me about the fast team he once sported in Indiana, and I wager considerable. He never drove a horse in his life, except it was to the pound that he might get half the fine. But this is the way he spun his yarn. Did the boys tell you about the span I used to drive down at Grab Corners? No? Wow, that's queer. I owned a mighty fast pair while I was stopping thar. You see, I first had a four-year-old hoss and used to go buzzing through the village like a streak of lightning. And when I had just enough whiskey aboard to make me feel a little reckless, I used to turn the corners on the inner two wheels and never make a miss of it. My ambition was to own a span, though. Arter a while, I bought a young mare from Deacon Shovel Ridge. She was the homeliest-looking critter, though, you ever sought eyes on. Her tail was as hairless as a garter snake. She was a basin-raised colt, and one morning she was standing round where the boys were making soap and while blacking up the blaze to get warm. Her tail caught fire, and every spare of hair was burned off, and never came out again either. It made her look pooty bad, but I see the go was in her, and that was what I was arter. During fly time I used to help her out of her troubles a little by passing a heavy tassel to the end of her tail. And arter some practice, she would fetch a fly off her ribs or a fore shoulder, eating most every pop. I got her pretty reasonable. The deacon said he was actively ashamed to go out with her, for the boys were always a hootin' out of him. Besides, the old codger seemed to have a liking for me, and others took my part when others were running me down. The mare matched the young hoss first rate. Both had hides like rhinoceroses, which sweat could never get through. It might be billing hot inside, but they never showed any signs of it outwardly. All their little training they pulled together and spatted it out as even as the wheels of a ferry boat. I used to make a commotion among the villagers when I turned out, for I could pass everything round the corners, and you ought to have seen the fellows a running out to hold their hosses by the head when they see me coming, and the women a hollering and tucking up their skirts and scudding arter their young'uns as though a Drove a Mexican cattle were a coming across the bridge. One day an old sport named Abe Drake, sort of spreein' old bachelor, came over thar from Illinois. He afterwards married a broken winded old concert singer that used to be a squeakin' around there, and went to live in Hulltown. Wow, as I was sayin', he came over there and brought a spankin' fine team along. They were amazin' nice lookin' critters now, I can tell you. Skin smooth and shiny as seals, and tails on em that actually trailed in the dust behind. He always had plenty of money. 
and was continually taking the gals around to one place or another. He was generally considered the biggest cat on the woodpile. We never came in contact when we had our teams out until one day at a picnic in Galdy's Wood. That straw-headed Kate Reichert was thar. She was a rollicking, don't-care gal of the village, one of those tree climbing uh, stride-riding critters, but a mighty good gal for all that, and handsome as a new fiddle. She was well up in the fine arts, but she could realize more genuine enjoyment charging through the pasture astride the old mooly cow, and she could by trumming a pianer. Well, there wasn't hardly a gal in the village that Abe Drake hadn't been a spurn around, and he had sort of commenced a trampin' on his wing like around Kate Reichert about this time. It happened I had sort of weakness that way myself, and I didn't like his maneuverin' any too well now, I can assure you. Couldn't make much out of Kate, though. She liked fast horses and a splurge, but she wasn't one of those gals that would marry an old pair of breeches just because there were greenbacks in the pockets. But, as I was remarking that day while the picnic was breaking up, we all got talking about a ball that was coming off the following week down to Crow Bend. Abe wanted Kate to go down thar with him, but she had partly agreed before that to go along or me. So to get herself out of it and me in, she said she would go with the one who could take her the fastest. Oh, that's me, said Abe, straightened up kind of proudly, and giving his pantaloons a hitch up at the waistband. I can let you count the panels along the turnpike a little the quickest of any person round these quarters. And he looked sideways at me to see how I took the assertion. It's not always the hen that does the most extensive advertising that makes the largest deposits, said Tom Ruggles, laughing, as he sat there packing away his dishes. No, Tom, said Gus Parks, the millinery man, who didn't like Abe any too well, because he sort of smashed an engagement between him and the schoolmarm. And it's not always your longest tail quadrupeds that get over the ground the faster than other. Well, ow, never mind, boys, says I. Just easy, that way. The proof of the whiskey is in the headache arterwards. I reckon I can kill as many grasshoppers between here and grab corners as any person that cracks a whip in these parts. What? With them thick-skinned critters of yours? said Abe, pointing his fingers at my hosses and laughing as though it was mighty funny. It made me feel pooty riley, but I kept my temper. Supposing they have thick skins, I says, there's something like the cheese that Google-eyed Peter bought from the peddler. Their peculiarity doesn't lie in the thickness of their hide so much as in the mysterious way they have of moving themselves around. Suppose you try a race back to the corner then, says one of the boys. Yes, says Kate Reichert, clapping her hands and jumping up. I'll ride back to the corner with one of you, and let Tilly Evans go with the other, and I'll go to the ball with the one who gets to the village first. Agreed, says Abe. And you'll ride back with me? No, I'm heavier than Tilly, says Kate. Let everything be even. Toss up for partners back to the corner. This seemed fair, so we flipped, and I won Kate. She weighed ten pounds more than Tilly. I didn't care for that, for I knowed if the worst came to the worst. She was none of your jumping out kind. She would stick to the buggy while there was one wheel in the seat left. And that's the sort of gal to have along with the feller when he's trying hoss flesh. The whole picnic gathered round us when we were getting our teams ready, and were speculating on the result. Money was gwin up on all sides. Parson Briarly had no change about him, but he bet his gold bowed spectacles against the old silver thorn's meerschaum pipe that i would get to the corner first beat him jim says gus parks and i'll give kate the best bonnet in the store and i'll give her the highest heeled pair of boots that i've got in my shop said tom ruggles the boot and shoe dealer then kate is a bonnet and a pair of boots ahead for sartin says i jumping into the buggy and squaring round my horses for the road and with that we started lickety-split, down the turnpike. Abe a little ahead, but not enough to make difference with the five miles of good turnpike ahead of us, without let or hindrance. Pooty soon, Kate leaned over to me, and see she, you must beat him, Jim, for between you and me, I would rather go to the ball with you than with Abe. This made me feel mighty good, and says I, 
We mustn't get scared, then, for I reckon we'll have to take some desperate chances to get there first. Let me alone for that, sees she, when I can't ride as fast as a hoss can run, and I'll stay to hum and let Dad tote me around in the wheelbarrow. Just then we came up with them. He tried to shake us off and would spur it ahead, but I'd crawl up on him again and stick thar, lappin' him and goin' with him stretch for stretch like a dog when he's a freezin' to a pig's ear. Away went Kate's hat a flutterin' over a buttercup of swale, like a bird of paradise over the Garden of Eden. That's mighty bad, Kate, says I, lookin' over my shoulder at it sailin' off. Let it go hatchin', says Kate, laughin'. It's only gettin' out of the way of the new bonnet. I thought, t'was a good omen myself, but didn't say anything, for just then Abe shot a little ahead, and he was gwing off, he hollered. You can't do it, Jim. I can, says I, determinedly. Your horses are jittin' out. They ain't got the bottom into them, he shouted, just that way. You must have dropped out last night, says I, and with that I overhauled him again. Past Brian O'Laughlin's dooryard, we went like a whirlwind through a flour mill, over a hen and three sucking pigs. The old woman was standing there in the yard with her apron full of chickens, shaking her fist at us and swearing like a drunken gypsy. Her long tongue was a slushing and dashing her answer one front tooth like a mop against a table leg. I could have laughed myself to tears, only I had to keep my eyes clear, for the road was so narrow in some places that when we were abreast, there wasn't any ground to spare. We were now passing the halfway spring, and the race was fully as undecided as men we broke away from the hootin' crowd on the picnic grounds. Down past old Deacon Shovel Ridge's ten acre hop yard, we went rackety bang, hub end against the hub end, and the outer wheels a spoke in it within six inches of a four foot ditch. The ride to the corners began to look like the ride to eternity, and Tilly was as pale as a grey nun's ghost and continually making nervous reaches for the lines. But Kate was equal to the surroundings. There she sat, with one arm around me, and the other grasping the seat rail. And above the clatter of hooves and steel axles, I could hear her repeating, Stick to it, Jim, and start my stitches, if he doesn't get his crop full of dust yet. Old Shovel Ridge was in the field on a load of hay as we were passing. He was inclined to piety, and if the world had no hosses in it, I reckon he'd have been as pious as a church organ. And when he saw us a raspin' down the turnpike as though we were riding in a four-hoss chariot, and saw Kate Riker's great swat of blonde hair streaming out behind like the tail of a comet, he couldn't contain his feelings no how. He'd gin a rousin' whoop like a chill-chat Indian when he sights a fur hunter, throwing away the pitchfork, which accidentally harpooned the old lady in the back who was raking behind. And jumping from the load, he took across the field towards the turnpike, swinging his old straw hat and hollering, Go it, Dudley! Go it! Keep the hoss up with the rat-tailed mare, and I'll bet my farm you'll make grab corner first. This made me feel pretty good, for the mare was the one I had some fears about. But you ought to see how it affected Abe. He commenced to slash his hosses and swear like an ox teamster when his cart is stuck hub deep in the mud. Finally the off-horse broke, and there was a sort of irregular upheaval among them for a while, as though they were stepping out on broken cakes of ice. One would be gwine down while the other was a-coming up. Abe tried to bring them down to their work again, and in the meantime a kind of corkscrewed ahead and swung into the center of the road in advance of him, and I began to feel something like a feller that holds the winning cards, and sees the other chaps a-piling up the coin on their inferior pasteboards. But I see some young half-breeds a-squatting round on the road about a quarter of a mile ahead, and knowed at the rate we were travelling we'd be on top of them before they'd see us if I didn't haul up. So I says to Kate, See them plaguey brats ahead of us, sir? What bed we better do about it? Ran over the centipedes, says she. He made a grin slack up for him, and she cuddled closer to me so the jolt wouldn't hiss her out. I shouted two or three times. But they were too busy with their mud pies, I reckon, to take any notice, and Abe was making no signs of hauling up. I did my best to sheer round him and kept right on for the corner. I heard him scream as we went a-whirling on, but reckon it was more, though, a fright than injury. Abe had lost his grippings. He couldn't overhaul me again, no how. I gradually crawled away from him, if he did his pootiest. The whole village seemed to be out to the bridge to see what was coming. 
they see the dust risin' when we were more than a mile away, and they allowed the greatest run away was a comin' down the turnpike that had happened since Bull Run, and we were out thar speculatin' as to whose family was in danger. But when they see it was a race and recognize me, you ought to see the scatter amongst them. You think a whole menagerie had broken loose and was comin' for em. Old Pelvey, the shoemaker, was a settin' on the railin' of the bridge, but just as I crossed it, the crowd hurrayed and jostled him off. He hung over the railin' by one leg, with his body swayin' below, and him a-hollerin' like a good feller, and signalin' for help. But the crowd were so taken up with the race, and were cheerin' and swingin' other hats continually, they never knew anything about his position. Pretty soon his leg slipped, and over he went, and over and more than twenty feet into the river, and was carried over the falls before anybody missed him. Arter that, people weren't troubled so much with corns around Grab Corner, but though he's dead now, I'll say it of him, he was the worst shoemaker that ever shoveled an all into a hide. I drove up to the hotel, and it just got through helping Kate out, and up come Abe, with his hosses hobbling as if they'd picked up a twenty-penny nail in every hoof. They looked somewhat as if they had been swimming in a soap fat. Abe was very much of a man, though, arter all. His hosses, I reckon, had never been passed before. But he didn't bluster or get mad about it, neither, though it must have been pooty trying to him. By the witch of Endor's long eye tooth, he cried, as he jumped from the buggy. You did it, Jim. You did it fair. Only I kind of think you swung in ahead of me a little too quick. Back thar where that crazy old whipperin' hollered so. No, Abe, says I. I didn't take an inch of turnpike till I was entitled to it. Well, says he, as he came round to look at my animals that were standing there seemingly as cool as a brace of toads in a cellar. I'll be shot if them hosses of yourn ain't something like the witter tappin' boarders. Speed that they show was getting away with anything was most surprising. So Kate Riker got the bonnet and boots, and I gin her a new dress to go with them, and if we didn't shine out some the next week down to Crow Ben, and there ain't no use talking about it. That's all. End of section seventy one. Read by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section seventy two of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Olio Margarine. Through the busy, bustling street rolls a cart I often meet, the driver shouting from the seat oleo margarine on the tailboard long and wide reaching fair from side to side shines the word in painted pride oleo margarine what it is doth not appear where it comes from all may fear still i shudder when i hear oleo margarine here and there he slowly crawls, pausing by the butcher's stalls. In the kitchen door he bawls, Oleo margarine. Bring your tallow, bring your fat, candle ends and all like that. They will issue from the vat, Oleo margarine. Any scraps you have about, kidney, liver, tripe or snout, all will make when they're tried out oleo margarine comes the cry across the way from a dame with rent to pay do you purchase puppies say oleo margarine is he fat the driver cries i should say so she replies then pitch him in where pussy lies oleo margarine in the church or at the play in the parlour night or day still the voices seem to say oleo margarine from the birds that round me fly in the brook that babbles by 
still I seem to catch the cry, Olio margarine. With suspicion now I spread the cow's rich offering on my bread, that weird butter still I dread, Olio margarine. Dainties now I must forego, pies and cakes and puddings, oh, can I trust them? No, no, no. Olio margarine. End of section 72. Read by Alan Mapstone. Section number 73 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by K. Burke. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. Dining Under Difficulties. Taking dinner today in a restaurant, I was in danger of being carried off by cockroaches. If I was inclined to draw comparisons, I would say that in size, the cockroaches I encountered in this place would compare favorably with cupboard door buttons. I had seen these troublesome insects on former occasions when I thought they were numerous, when they were as thick around the bread plate as bees around their hive in June, but I had never been present when they turned out in sufficient numbers to take and hold possession of everything upon the table, even to the mustard pot. Today I witnessed such a spectacle. I counted until I tired, their scalping to and fro made the task painfully difficult, and the effort was abandoned. They had evidently been lying in ambush in the cruet stand from the moment I sat down and gave my order, for the ring of the plate as it struck the board seemed to be the signal for a general advance. They appeared in military ranks, moving toward the dish in a semicircle, like a line of Fenian skirmishers advancing heroically upon a turnip patch. There were no frost-nipped fellows with drooping horns and dragging limbs among these legions either. All were active, square-shouldered customers, real thoroughbreds, wide across the hips and boasting a depth of chest capable of enduring any amounts of running, while their long, formidable-looking feelers stood out at right angles from their heads like the horns on a Mexican steer. During your natural life, I commenced addressing a waiter who stood nearby, evidently enjoying my surprise, whether while officiating as head steward on board of a floating palace on the Mississippi, or serving as second cook on a grain scow on the San Joaquin, did you ever run across a place where the cockroaches were one-ninetieth part as numerous as they are in this restaurant? Numerous, he answered. You should be here on a warm, sunshiny day, if you want to see cockroaches, for then all the invalids are out, those fellows who have had their movements across the table accelerated by a snapping finger, or such as have only tasted the poison scattered around for their benefit, or those who have taken an overdose and thrown it up again. These lie in cracks and cupboards with stiffened joints and weak stomachs when the weather is cold and cloudy, but when a warm day comes they are all abroad and busy. Well, I will bear that in mind, I said, rising from the table, and when the next total eclipse of the sun occurs, which, as I am informed, will take place in about four hundred and thirty-seven years, I may come into this restaurant for another meal, and not until then. And with that I left. End of section number 73. Section number 74 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Answers to Correspondence The editor of a city paper, having occasion to take a trip into the country, prevailed upon me to assume the responsibility of answering letters from correspondents. The task is an onerous one, the more so as the editor, with that cunning ever noticeable in a person who takes the cream of a job, left me to reply only to the naughtiest epistles. But I will sometime get even with him, however. I will assume the editorial we, and should I waken the wrath of any person, he will be the sufferer. Here is a copy of my answer to Katie. The minister was perfectly right in refusing to marry the couple, if, as you say, the bride insisted upon holding her poodle in her arms during the ceremony. The more so, as the clergyman was near-sighted. He might possibly mistake the puppy for the bridegroom. Another person accuses a correspondent of a misstatement. He says it was the editor of the farmer, and not the editor of the examiner, who planted the package of number 16 homeopathic pills sent him from the country by a wag as the seeds of a Sandwich Island cabbage. The old editor for weeks regularly watered the plot where he sowed them. But as nothing appeared, wrote to the country gentleman, informing him that his seeds hadn't sprouted, and he thought it likely they might have been taken from a dead head. Amy is all in a fluster about spirits. I will talk to her after this manner. We have always considered spiritualism the bluest carbuncle that ever festered upon the neck of society. We care not if the spirits were wrapping around our table like a forty-stamp mill. We would eat our regular allowance with all the coolness that a celestial manifests when absorbing his bird's nest soup. If your bed dances a pasule after you get into it at night, there must be more than spirits around. And you would do well to throw a bootjack or flat iron under it before retiring. Such a proceeding might give you the satisfaction of hearing the spirits yell blue murder. There is not much danger of your going crazy, because, in plain terms, we consider you to be loony already. The poor fellow in the lunatic asylum, who imagines Queen Victoria has made a private residence of his nose, and who has nearly blown both eyes out striving to eject her, is hardly more so. I trust the editor will lose some hair over that answer. On second thought, I remember the editor has none. End of section number 74 Read by Lisa Gibson, Lincoln, Montana, January 3, 2022. Section 75 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox Courtroom Scenes I am as full of law this evening as a seashell of sound, having been wedged in the district courtroom from 10 o'clock a.m. to 9 p.m., listening to testimony in the retrial of the case of the people versus a fiery lady, if we may use the expression, who brought down her game the first shot. Though the room was crowded almost to suffocation, I fancy there is not that deep interest that was manifested during the former trial. On that occasion, there were so many letters introduced in evidence, such a mass of private correspondence dragged from musty trunks and laid open to the public, that thousands flocked daily to the courtroom in hopes of hearing something rich, if not instructive. I shall never forget the excitement during the reading of letter number 947, it was from the defendant. The counsel for the defense argued a good round two hours and a half by the courtroom clock, against the letter being admitted in evidence. He maintained it was irrelevant, as it had never been opened, the receiver forgetting to read it, or neglecting to do so, for some reason of his own. The counsel for the people followed with even a longer appeal to the judge to admit the letter, strengthening his argument by lengthy quotations from Blackstone, Kent, Wharton, and other authorities, endeavoring to prove it should be put in evidence, as its contents might assist materially in furthering the ends of justice. The judge began to show unmistakable signs of impatience. He remarked that already a package of letters had been read that would go far towards shingling the mechanic's pavilion, and had no more bearing upon a point of issue than 
Darwin's descent of man had upon the culture of white beans. He finally gave way before the preponderance of the prosecuting attorney's argument, and directed an officer to wake the jury, as a letter was to be read that all should hear. After considerable shaking and poking, this difficult duty was performed. Even the deaf juror was aroused, though the good-natured judge had permitted him to sleep during the introduction of several preceding epistles. After order was restored, and an inventive juror had improvised an ear-trumpet with a piece of legal cap for his unfortunate companion, the bill of due was opened. As the seal was broken, judge and jury rose to their feet with one accord, and leaned as far forward as their desks would allow the more readily to catch every word of the important document. The silence in the room was deathlike. It was supposed that on the contents of this letter hung either a scaffold or an acquittal. The weak ticking of the dusty clock upon the wall was the only sound that disturbed the awful stillness. As the calm settled, the muffled beat of the timepiece increased in force and volume until it seemed to attain the tones of a fire bell. Presently the attorney, in a high and tremulous voice, began to read. The contents ran thus. My dear, delightful darling, how are my stocks selling now? Your loving, adoring L. The effect was thrilling. The lawyer dropped the letter upon the table before him, ran his white fingers through his hair, and looked around with the air of a tired traveler, when he ascertains he has walked five miles upon the wrong road. The gentleman of the jury, who looks more of anger than of sorrow, dropped into their seats as suddenly as though an invisible hand had caught them from behind and jerked them to their benches. The judge, with an ill-concealed look of disgust, settled back into his chair, and the deep crease in his vest, immediately over where his dinner should have been hours before, grew more painfully perceptible. I elbowed my way from the suffocating room before further correspondence was selected from the package for perusal. End of section 75. Read by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 76 of Frontier Humor in verse prose and picture this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org frontier humor in verse prose and picture by palmer cox the mason's ride the goat, the goat, the bearded goat, the horned, the hooved, the hairy goat. As I'm a sinner of some note, last night I rode the mason's goat. He was a beast of wondrous size, with lengthy limbs and glassy eyes, and beard that swept the carpet clear, and horns that shook the chandelier ye gods if there's a time we feel misgivings through our noddle steal it is when we through mystery float upon the dark freemason's goat now some will say there's no such thing and at the goat derision fling and say that all is fancy wrought through fear and dread suspicion brought but those who such remarks outpour have never knocked at mason's door have nothing known about that beast that was imported from the east where kings of wisdom wealth and pomp bestrode him through his midnight rump three times i was compelled to ride the creature round the temple wide but while I tried the fearful mount, my heart's pulsations all might count, for thump on thump with treble knell, within my breast it rose and fell. Twice did I make the circuit fair, my hold his horns, his tail, or hair, though never shot a kangaroo, so fast Australian jungle through from garret roof to basement floor through ante-room and closet door 
o'er winding steps and columns tall he held his way through house and hall till on the third attempt at last when i presumed all danger past he pitched me clear of horns and head and left me far below for dead i felt as though a worthless clod unfit to keep above the sod but when i rose with terror pale the goat had vanished head and tail and i was styled by one and all the greenest mason in the hall let those who deem they are possessed of fadeless cheeks and valiant breast of hair that never will aspire to bristle like a brush of wire no matter through what risk they run go ride that goat as i have done end of section seventy six recording by alan mapstone section number seventy seven of frontier humor in verse prose and picture this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by k burke frontier humor in verse prose and picture by palmer cox june o oh, june thou comest once again with bales of hay and sheaves of grain that make the farmer's heart rejoice and anxious herds lift up their voice i hear thy promise sunny maid sound in the reaper's ringing blade and in the laden harvest wain that rumbles through the stubble plain ye tell a tale of bearded stacks of busy mills and flowery sacks of cars oppressed with cumbrous loads hard curving down their iron roads of barges grounding on their way down winding streams to reach the bay of vessels spreading to the breeze their snowy sails in stormy seas while bearing to some foreign strand the products of this golden land ye come again with cereal brows and crescent blade to fill the mouths and never fall thy feet too soon o oh, ever welcome sunny june once more i see your banner spread across the evening sky i see your trace in shallow brooks that feebly ripple by i see your face in mirror lakes in fields and forests old and in the gardens all arrayed in crimson blue and gold i hear your voice in twittering birds that round the gables wheel and in the humming monologues which from the meadows steal o month of love and plighted faith and airy castles high i hear you in the lover's song and in the maiden's sigh and in the breeze that gently wakes the leaves upon the bough i feel your soothing mother touch caressing cheek and brow o oh, sweet as sunrise to the lark as noonday to the bee or evening to the nightingale is june's return to me end of section number seventy seven section number seventy eight of frontier humor in verse prose and picture this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anniversary This is the anniversary of my departure from my native fields. As I sit gazing by the fire, pondering over the event, thoughts of friends far away and foes who are near come crowding upon me numerous as spirits around some favored medium. Many years ago, I turned my back upon all I loved, and setting my face against the sinking sun, cried, Ho, sailors, spread your widest sails, and court the strong impellent gales, until the stout and stubborn mast bends like a sapling to the blast. And westward let your bearing be, my fortune lies beyond the sea. What a ruinous rent fifteen or twenty years make in a person's lease of life! Why, bless my benighted understanding! The seal, the signature, and the better portion of the parchment are gone. 
there's hardly enough document remaining upon which to hinge a hope. Now that I think of it, what have the departed years neglected to bring me? No flaxen heads cluster around my board, no noses flattened against the window pane, no eye strained to mark my coming, when the granite pave is chafed by the homeward hastening feet. No jute or mohair chignons lie around my room in rich profusion, adding charms to the apartment that pictures cannot give. When I muse upon the many blessings that the past years have failed to furnish, I am inclined to sadness. But when I turn to contemplate what they have brought, my heart sinks down into its lowest recess, and for a time lies still. Ay, that's the rub that makes me wince. There is but little satisfaction in the thought that I am not alone in this. I look around and I see others drifting down the stream as rapidly as I. Time is cutting furrows and fairer brows than mine. He has brought many a person during the last ten years. A scattered sight, a limping gait, toothless gums, and a shining pate. Why should I squeal because I feel his hands? But where are those full cheeks, those hopeful smiles, those luxuriant locks and firm-set grinders that once were mine? Gone, like the life from a busted balloon. Gone, like the soul from a ruptured bassoon. Gone, like the sheen from a pock-pitted cheek. Gone, like our change at the close of the week. Gone. But what has that to do with my sore heel, peeled today by the hoof of a clergyman's horse before I could get out of the way? The event called forth the following lines, written while laboring under great mental excitement. How blessed is he above the many, who turns today a handsome penny, by stating to the drowsy throng the line dividing right and wrong. Far richer pickings he commands than ears of corn rubbed in the hands. How different now from days of yore, when sandal shod and spirits sore, with stiffened joints and limber thews, and garments damp with midnight dews, the poor apostles, staff in hand, went limping through a stranger's land. Now charge they up and down the way, like jockeys on the derby day, and we poor whites must waltz aside, and let the pulpit princes glide, or have a fit and orus wheeled, or have our heels adroitly peeled. O oh, money, money, root and start, of every sin tis claimed thou art, but let them doubt the fact who will, Tis money spreads the gospel still. End of section number 78. Read by Lisa Gibson, Lincoln, Montana, January 3rd, 2022. Section 79 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mark Wayne. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox. A Country Tour. Yesterday I took a trip to a quiet country resort. On entering the town, I was surprised at the scarcity of men in the place. There were plenty of women fashionably dressed and otherwise, to be seen in the houses or gardens, but I rarely encountered one of the male sex in my travels through the streets. This, I at first supposed, was owing to the number of gentlemen residing there who carry on business in the city by the sea, and are consequently in the latter place during the day. I was informed, however, by the proprietor of the hotel at which I stopped, that such was not the case. He assured me it was mainly owing to the fact that the county court commenced that morning, and most of the male inhabitants, as was their custom on such occasions, had taken to the surrounding woods and mountains to escape jury duty. The place is beautifully situated between high green hills, and said to possess the healthiest climate of any town in the state. During the summer months, people flock there from all parts of the country. Healthy people pay high prices at the hotels for the privilege of living there, and sickly people do likewise for the privilege of dying there. The peculiarities of the town, and the distinctive manners and customs of the inhabitants, have been ably described by a poet whose effusions have not yet been translated into the foreign languages. 
following is a part of the poem which bears directly on the town in question. Here rest we now by sulphur well, where invalids and nurses dwell, where yelping dogs run through the street, like wolves across a prairie wide, and cattle wild as bison meet you face to face on every side, with tails in air and frothy nose, and leveled horns they round you close, where people sit around the door in lazy groups of three or four, and still their chronic thirst abate with copious draughts of sulphur straight. There was quite an excitement in the town before I left. A fire broke out in an ash barrel situated in the rear yard of the house at which I was stopping, and for a time threatened to destroy the ashes. There is no estimating the amount of damage the citizens might have suffered if the fire had spread to a wash tub that stood close by, and which at the time contained a portion of the town's washing. Business was generally suspended, and stock in the insurance companies went down immediately. The citizens breathed more freely, however, when the efficient and energetic fire department turned out promptly as one man and hastened to the city waterworks, situated on a slight eminence in the center of the town, and, turning on the water, succeeded in extinguishing the flames. The only damage done was the partial burning of the barrel and the scorching of the wash tub and five dog houses. The dogs were lying under the kitchen stove at the time, and escaped injury. End of section 79。section 80 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose, and Picture by Palmer Cox A Trip Across the Bay I took a trip across the water this afternoon. The bay was so rough the ferry boat could scarcely make her trips. The passengers were nearly all seasick, and elbow to elbow leaned over the side of the vessel. One gentleman, while gazing into the sea, lost his hat overboard but he was so taken up with internal affairs that he cared little for outward appearances, as one could readily observe. I reached my destination and was convinced that all the sorrows are not on the sea. I saw a poor old woman thrown into terrible disorder by a kick from the cow she was milking in her own yard. Judging by the quantity of milk lying around loose, she must have been nearly through her task, and was probably in the very act of complimenting the cow for her generosity, when the spiteful animal gave the pail a hoist completely over the woman's head, like a huge helmet, while the lacteal fluid ran down her body. The pail seemed to stick, despite her efforts to remove it. As I looked back, I could see her groping toward the house, her visage still concealed in the blue bucket. She did look odd enough as she felt her way up the steps, decorated with that novel headdress. There is a youth in this suburban town who bids fair to be a second landseer. As I passed his father's residence, I saw the young aspirant at work, sketching from nature. He had the foot of a little cur, fast in the jaws of a steel trap, staked in the orchard. The artist sat at a short distance, sketching the poor beast as it stood on three legs, gazing at the heavens and crying piteously. He was eagerly striving to get the expression of pain upon the dog's face, and by the grin upon his own countenance, I judged he was succeeding. There was something in the pair that reminded me of Parhasius and the captive, and being in somewhat of a sketching mood myself at the time, I produced my book and pencil, and leaning over the fence, sketched the painter and his howling model. On my way back to the city, the bay seemed even rougher than in the morning. There was hardly a passenger on board the ferry boat, but showed symptoms of trouble, although most of them would have been excellent subjects for the artist of a comic pictorial. My attention was specially directed towards an elderly lady who sat with folded arms, the elbows resting upon her knees and a most woe-begone expression upon her wrinkled visage. Some passengers who were sick were able partly to conceal their emotions. She was not. Every muscle of her face betrayed her. She was sick and couldn't help but show it. If any individual amongst the crowd of disquieted passengers knocked louder at the door of human sympathy than did the old lady referred to, it was unmistakably the woman who was sick and had to show it at the vessel's rail. End of section 80. Read by Sandra. 
New Montreal, 2021. Section 81 of Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Frontier Humor in Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. I sit idly by my window listening to the rapid patter of the rain upon the shingles, and the wild whistle of the wind as it plays around the gables, or draws weird music from the telegraph wires stretched between the housetops, and upon which dangles the ghost of many a schoolboy's kite. Christmas Eve, and I am not yet invited out to dinner. What can this mean? Am I then left to wither for want of attention, like some poor shrub plucked from a garden, and plant it in a graveyard? Well, let it be so. Alone though I am, I nevertheless enjoy myself hugely, and it requires considerable to enliven me now. There was a time when I could be moved to mirth by very little. The desperate efforts of a one-legged grasshopper describing circles while endeavoring to leap straight ahead would amuse me for hours together. But it is not so now. I turn from such scenes to bury my eyes in the pages of profound works, and it is meet and proper I should. For the last half hour I have been watching an old washerwoman stealing, as I think, a neighbor's wood. It is barely possible that she is taking this method of paying herself for services rendered at the tub. Be this as it may, the wood is going. There is no mistake about that. It is interesting to me, as it furnishes food for comment, and keeps the mind from lagging too long around the saddening fact that time is writing lines upon my brow with his antique pen. Besides, it is holiday season, and though I am not able to be charitable to a great degree, I can at least afford to be indifferent in this case. The washerwoman is doubtless a hard-working and deserving old body, who perhaps has sunk her whole week's earnings in a Christmas turkey, that her children's hearts may be glad and their stomachs full, and it would be a great pity if it should be spoiled in the cooking for the want of fuel. I waive the crime, and speak of the fact from a disinterested standpoint. I have been such a diligent scholar in the severe school of experience that I have learned to look upon my own misfortunes lightly, and certainly can behold with an unmoistened eye, my neighbor's choicest sticks noiselessly slipping into an adjoining yard. Besides, my neighbor can afford to lose a few. To make my position good, I entrench myself behind the following fact. To be in the fashion, he pays the price of a good-sized farm for seats at the opera, where the language is as foreign to his understanding as South Sea Island gibberish. While he indifferently beholds such a wasteful running at the bung, why should I assume the busybody's role and clap my finger on the dripping spigot? Besides, I saw his wife last evening with fully four yards of expensive satin trailing in the dust. It was my misfortune to be walking directly behind her. As the crowd was pressing me onward, I was obliged to dance a sailor's hornpipe around the hall in order to keep from treading upon her skirts. It needed not the grins of onlookers to assure me that I was cutting a ridiculous figure. I am now enjoying my revenge. Indirectly though it comes, it is none the less sweet or acceptable. On the contrary, it is rather more gratifying, as it calls for no action on my part, but simply to keep my mouth hermetically sealed. The poet truly sings, Time at last sets all things even. It has been in this case much quicker than I expected. As the skinny white arm stretches up out of the gloom of the washerwoman's yard, and another billet shoots from the pile and disappears like a star from the firmament of heaven, I feel that a load is lifted from my heart, and I am reaping revenge. Stay! Uh, what is this? A note that all the evening escaped my notice. Lo, an aroma issues from it, sweet as Cytheria's breath. It is an invitation, as I live, 
to help dissect a Christmas turkey. Sound the timbrel, beat the tom-tom, I am not forgotten yet. End of section 81 In the Frontier Humor and Verse, Prose and Picture by Palmer Cox